in the spotlight. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Thank you for coming out on this cool, miserable night. And for those of you at home, lazy people. Um, there we go. Oh, is it really bright? <laughs> it's fine, don't worry. This is what we've got going tonight. Um, little um, warning notice down the bottom right that I've been asked to put in. Um, we've got a little bit of news um, at the start, what's coming up soon, and then the main event for the evening is Dr. Juan Hernandez Santista. I hope I said that right. Good. From the University of St. Andrews. Uh, it turns about echo mapping of supermassive black holes. Sounds great. I'll do the sky in November after that, and then there's tea and coffee and... You can chat if you like. So I, I'd show this. This is the background I'm using tonight. This is by one of our members, Eros Tang, the Eastern Vale Nebula. Believe it or not, that was taken from the center of Edinburgh, not using our observatory in Spain, but from the center of Edinburgh. I think it's absolutely amazing. It's coming up well. Lots of really fine detail in there. Um, I mentioned this at the last meeting when we were online, but this is the first time um, in person. So. Um, we are going to be 100. We're in our, our 100th year already, and that started on the 15th of October last month. Um, we're not starting our celebrations quite yet. That'll start in 2024, but we are aiming for a special event on the 15th of October 2024, when we'll, we will be 100 years old. But as you know, we have started already doing a few things. We have our ASARO, our ASE Remote Observatory, set up, and... Um, we have a project where we're giving away meter camera kits to schools as well. I'll say a bit more about those. So uh, just a, a brief update on where we are with our observatory. As you know, we've had the, the wide field scope operating for some time now, and we have some amazing images on our uh, Flickr group for that. Um, the main scope was temporarily installed, but um, when they measured the height of it, they real the, the observatory people realized they calculated the height wrong, and the roof won't open or close with the big scope on. So. <laughs> Um, they are building um, new buildings, new observatories nearby, next door, and they are almost complete, and we will get into that, and we will get a better position in there as well, so a better field of view. So um, The weather's been stopping them doing it, but they reckon it. Um, so it is, a, it is a STEM project, or STEAM as, as it's called there, it includes the arts um, for youth, and um, it's great fun using these cameras, catching meteors every night, um, and great fun to set up. The other main project we've done is one by one of our members, Randall Stevenson, who pulled together all the history of the society, and that is on the members' uh, website. I mentioned that before, and I read a little bit out of the history um, last time, but it really is a, a good piece of work. So if you haven't had a look at it yet, then please go and have a look at it on the members' site. It's, it's, a, it's a good story. Lots of ups and downs, skullduggery, and all sorts of stuff involved in our story of the past, but uh, very interesting. Sorry? Subscriptions are due. We're due on the 1st of October. Only 57% renewed so far, so please don't leave it too much longer or poor Alan will get fed up chasing you. Lots of ways of staying in touch with us on our website, um, Facebook group, um, Twitter, or X, as it's now called. We have loads of videos on our YouTube channel. Um, we did masses over lockdown, and we um, have pretty much all of the, the, the meeting videos we've had over the last few years as well. So lots of really good stuff there from some amazing speakers. And this one tonight will be, will be on there afterwards. We have Flickr groups um, from images taken by people with their own kit and also from our um, observatory in Spain as well. So have a look at those. So this is what we've got coming up next. Um, on Wednesday next week, we have our imaging and observing group. That's for uh, members only. And it's a <coughs> A great, a great place where we all learn together, look at each other's images, um, have little chats about different techniques and tools and equipment and so on. Um, always a really good, a good time. That's totally online now. The 17th of November, we have an online-only meeting, a traveler's guide to the stars. Uh, this was rescheduled from early in the year when it had to be cancelled. That's by Les Johnson. That will be on Zoom for members and um, YouTube for visitors. On the 1st of December, we'll be back here again for a hybrid meeting, The Search for Life by Richard Shaw, and that'll be on YouTube for visitors as well. Um, and the last one of the year, on the 15th of December, um, an online meeting, The Science of Palomar Observatory with Stephen B. Flanders. So that should be, should be really interesting. If you do follow us on Eventbrite, for people on YouTube particularly, uh, we're leaving it because they're starting to charge 
even for free events, which is um, not something we want to pay for. So we won't be using that anymore. So if you do follow us, follow us on our Facebook um, feed, Twitter, Blue Sky, we're on, and our website as well. You'll always find everything we're doing on the website. And visitors are always welcome, here or online. That's it um, from me. So it's over to our speaker for the night. Um, so John, yep, go up. Thank you. Uh, okay, are you can hear me okay? Fantastic. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and to share you all my, my research uh, that I have been doing for the last few years since I've arrived into Scotland. Um, so my name is Juan Hernandez Antistevan. Uh, I'm a Mexican engineer slash astronomer. Uh, I've, I've also worked in, a, in an astronomical society back home, so I know exactly what it is to be uh, on that side, uh, looking at people over here and now. I'm very glad that I'm here now trying to share what I, what I know about the universe. So today I'm going to talk to you about supermassive black holes and what we can do with this technique called echo mapping, to trying to understand how, how these, super, these giants at the center of galaxies can actually feed material into them and grow uh, throughout the history of the universe. So, why should we care about supermassive black holes? Uh, so what you have here, probably many of you have seen before, this is the Hubble Deep Field. So this is one of the deepest images ever taken by, uh, by humanity. And everything that you see here is a galaxy. And at the center of every single one of these galaxies, we have very strong evidence that a supermassive black hole lies at its center. And so they are ubiquitous. It doesn't matter where we look and how far we look into the universe, these monsters appear everywhere. And what we have come to understand over the last few, uh, over the last decades, and particularly through simulations, is that ga how galaxies grow from the start of the Big Bang and how they start collapsing into stars and forming galaxies, uh, they also, these supermassive black holes also co-evolve with the galaxies themselves. So they are intrinsic and, and, uh, and important blocks of, the gal of galaxy evolution. Um, so here you have a, an amazing simulation from the illustrious uh, group uh, where you can see the filaments from gas that condenses from uh, from very early on in the universe, and all at the center of these nodes where all the stars start to accumulate and where galaxies start to form, you start to observe like these massive uh, winds and material blowing out of these, uh, of these centers of, uh, uh, of these galaxies. And, and that is because of these supermassive black holes, uh, they're also, they're, you probably know them better for eating everything that comes around them. But supermassive black holes actually also feed back into the outer uh, galaxy a lot, uh, uh, quite a lot of material, and they impact. And this material that f gets flown out of the galaxy can impact how, uh, can regulate how many stars are being formed inside the galaxy itself. So how this, this mechanism of eating material and getting bigger, but also impacting how the galaxy grows itself, uh, one cannot now we, can no, we cannot decouple the black holes from the galaxy itself. They are all part of the same system. So trying to understand how supermassive black holes grow and how can they feed all this material is paramount not only to understand the black hole itself, but to understand how galaxies evolve uh, in the larger picture. Um, so how do we know that these supermassive black holes exist at the center of galaxies? I think this is probably the most direct image, uh, that one, of the, one of the best uh, experiments that can determine that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. So these uh, were two teams, one in Europe and one in the US, where they took images 
from the galactic center, uh, the center of our own galaxy. And what they saw is that, the, that many of these stars, uh, they, they, throughout the years, they could map the orbits around, around the stars, uh, from all the different stars. And then just applying just Newton's law and Kepler's law, they could actually realize that there should be something very compact that we cannot see that is governing, that is governing the orbits of all of, those, of all of those stars. And the only thing that we know that can comply with all of those requirements it's a, it's a black hole around four to five times the ma uh, million times the mass of our own sun. And for this, uh, for this work, uh, these two groups, uh, they were given uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in, in 2020. Um, so this is fantastic because this is, you can actually see them, right? But um, this plot, although looks a little bit boring, I think it's even more interesting. Um, so what you have here is you have the mass of the black hole on the on the left on, on the left hand side. Uh, let me see if this works. Can you see the laser point? Yeah, good. Um, so you have the mass of the black hole on the sort of the y-axis, and let's just focus on this one on the right hand side. So this is the velocity of the stars at the center of all the galaxies. So these, it turns out that they are correlated. So that means that the more massive the black hole is, the faster the stars are going around the black hole. Now, this is incredible, right? Because the black hole is actually very, very tiny in comparison to the whole galaxy, right? So even if you take gal stars that are flowing around the, the, the black hole, they are somehow being impacted by this tiny little thing. The gravity of the black hole shouldn't be impacting the orbit of all of these galaxies, and yet we find that somehow the stars that are orbiting very far out know about the mass of the black hole. So that is weird, right? So there should be some causal connection between how big the mass of the black hole is and how fast the stars are moving around. Um, and this is where this idea of feedback comes. So the black hole so not only its material, but can also expel quite a lot. And so we can connect these inner parts of the, uh, these inner regions of the black hole with the bigger and outer parts of the, uh, of the galaxy itself. Now, often we see galaxies like on the left-hand side, where you have just these very, uh, very bright bulge and then these beautiful spiral arms. But often we cannot see the black hole, right? The black hole is absolutely tiny. It's just below any resolution, uh, any telescope that you can point at it, you will never see the black hole itself. So one of the best ways to try to see the black hole is to try to target these galaxies where the nucleus is particularly bright. So these are known as active galactic nuclei or quasars. Uh, they're, they're, I'm probably going to use that name interchangeably throughout the, throughout the, throughout the talk. Um, so these quasars, these at the center of all of these galaxies, these active galactic nuclei, the, a lot of material is actually being funneling into the black hole and creating a, a, sort of like a pancake-like, uh, what we call an accretion disk. I'll have a picture of that in, in, in a minute. Uh, but the amount of light that is actually being emitted at that very close to the black hole can outshine the whole galaxy itself. That little point of light is brighter than the whole galaxy around it. So that's, that, that's how much energy you can actually extract from the material that is uh, spiraling from the black hole. So how can you make something so bright? Uh, so the, one of the ways to do that is through accretion disks. So accretion is this gradual growth of accumulation of matter under the influence of gravity. So that just means that if you have something massive enough, and if you have fluffy material around it, that material will just gradually go and come to, the, come to, that, uh, come to that object. Now, you, we see these accretion disks all, uh, all, uh, all over the universe, from the formation of planets to very, very small and compact binaries all the way to, uh, to, uh, to galaxies far out. And these can range from, uh, the, like the, the dynamic range of how big they can, uh, they can be, they're 
they're impressive, right? So just have this silly comparison of if you have a, something that can be the grain of salt and a same disk that behaves very similarly can be almost the size of the whole solar system. So the picture that we have in mind of what is actually happening is sort of this little video here, right? So you have this material that is flowing into the black hole. It doesn't really flow from everywhere, right? uh, from everywhere. The material actually will settle down into a plane, just like a pancake-like around the, around the black hole. Material will slowly drift on that material. That material will be orbiting, but slowly drifting in, just losing a little bit of energy and drifting in and plunging into the black hole. Now, the accretion disk can be incredibly bright, and this is what we see in this active galactic nuclei. Um, and I'd love to show you a picture of this, right? This would be the, this is the holy grail of what we want. Unfortunately, and I think I've already said it, the, the problem of imaging black holes is that they're very, very tiny, and galaxies are very, very far away. So we have a scale program, right? We cannot really take a telescope and just take a picture of it. Uh, scope. And uh, so try to image something like this. So, how can, so then how can we know anything about, us, uh, about what is happening close to the black hole? Fortunately, nature gives us a solution. And, and through a method called reverberation mapping or echo mapping, which is the topic of, of, of today's uh, talk. Um, and we can take advantage of something that active, uh, actively accreting supermassive black holes do, right? So these, uh, these AGNs are variable. They vary. So it, here you have an image taken from a one-meter telescope, I believe, in Chile. And it doesn't matter which, uh, which filter you take at which wavelength you, uh, you observe this AGN. They vary. So what you see here is a light curve, so this is time, so the whole span of that is about a year. And so this is, and this is one particular AGN uh, taken with 11 different filters uh, three times per day. Um, so they vary, and they vary quite a lot. And encoded in this variability that you observe, there's actually information about the sizes and the structure of the material that is flowing around the supermassive black hole. So we can use this variability, these bumps up and down from the images that we take in order to retrieve information on how the material is actually flowing and plunging into the black hole. And hopefully I will try to convince you that we have been able to do that. And the technique relies on something that, uh, that we often use here on Earth, uh, and it's just working with the same principle as a sonar, right? We don't need to go to the bottom of the seafloor in order to have a very detailed map of what it looks like. So what we, the only thing that we know, uh, that we need in order to map that whole seafloor is two things. We need a signal that we can send down and then bounce up and retrieve it, and we need to know the, the speed at which that signal travels. So, so we can then emit some, uh, some sound waves down into the, into the bottom of the seafloor. We know the speed of sound in water. So depending on how, much, how long it takes for that signal to come back, we can know the distance to the seafloor and then make a very detailed map without sending a single person to the bottom of the seafloor. So we can do the same thing, apply the same technique, but do it in supermassive black holes. Just instead of using sound, we can use light. And we know the speed of light, so the only thing that we need now is to bounce that light from different parts and then trying to find these echoes, these delays in the, in the signals, so we can measure things in the, in the supermassive, uh, of, of, the, of, of the gas surrounding the mass of, of the, the gas of the mass, the gas of the black hole, and then try to create a map or a pseudo image of what is happening inside. So, Overall, we think that the inner part, so how the supermassive black hole is actually feeding, composed of broadly these sort of four different regions. So at the center, you have the massive, so this is like a cross-section of this accretion disk, this pancake-like structure. So here you have, at the center, you will have your black hole. Perpendicular to that, you will have these jets that are coming out, and you will have these very 
bright uh, and very hot region called the corona. So it's, uh, it's emitting uh, mostly in x-rays. Then surrounding that, then you have this, the, the accretion disk that is feeding material towards the, towards the black hole. And then as you go farther out, and as the temperature starts to drop, as you go further out of the black hole, then material starts to being lift off the, of the plane. So you have these very, what we think is very, um, very clumpy clouds that are just being lifted up that we called very, very unoriginally the broad line region. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then if you go further, further out, the temperature drops so much that the gas starts to become to dust. And you create this dusty torus, this dusty donut around the black hole uh, that is very thick and, uh, and, very, and, and, ver and, very, and very far out. So the whole idea of this technique is to try to use the light being emitted very close to the black hole and see if we can measure the echoes of the, uh, of the, of the light being generated close to the black hole as it is being echoed from all these different regions in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the AGM. And I'll, I'll go into that in a bit. So we think we have these four different regions. Um, so, if we can, so if we can think about how to measure these echoes, right? So th how this light is being echoed from these different regions, we can try and try to make experiments to try to measure each and every part of this component, uh, and e each and every component. Now, the problem is that these, these things are absolutely massive, right? So in order for it's emitting X-rays and gamma rays, which are absorbed in our atmosphere, so you need to go to space to observe it. And you can also, and the dusty torus, which is, has so low temperature that you have to observe it in the near, in the infrared. So you cannot do everything with the same kind of, with the same kind of instruments at the same time. So for the reminder of the talk, I will try to focus on just two of these, uh, two of these regions, uh, in this broad line region and in the accretion disk. So I'll start with the broad line region. So this broad line region, remember that these are these like cloudy, uh, uh, like clouds we think that are orbiting a little bit farther out than the accretion disk, um, and that and that they emit uh, and, that, and that they emit uh, uh, well at different wavelengths. Uh, but the neat thing about these clouds is that we think uh, there's very good evidence that they are orbiting very nicely in just. They're just orbiting around in equilibrium with the black hole. So they, these clouds, they just feel the talk of the black hole, and because there is really not much that disturbs them, they can just be happily just going, going around. So what is very neat, if, if, this is what, if this is what happens, is that then the gravity, then that these two, uh, that these, because they are in equilibrium, they, they're not going either further or out, um, you can actually use them to weigh the mass of the black hole, to weigh the black hole, right? So this is how we, for example, we have weighed the mass of our own sun. Uh, if you know how far, some, how far away these clouds are and how fast they are going, if the only thing that is making them orbit is the black hole, then this very simple equation can just give you the mass of the black hole. So how do we, how do we determine this? So let's imagine that we have this signal that gets generated very close to the black hole, and it travels, very, it, it, it travels without being, nothing happening directly to our telescopes, right? But imagine at the same time, some of those uh, rays of light, they don't go into our line of sight where telescopes are, but they actually intersect the, uh, these clouds. So these two rays of light are going out at the same time, but at different, in different trajectories. So one of them, we can receive him, but the other one goes to these clouds and then gets echoed back into our line of sight. Now this, if you can think about it, this, we will receive the signal coming from this trajectory first, because this one will take a different path in order to, to come around. If they are all traveling, at the speed of light, 
then if we can measure the difference in time of these echoes, we can measure what is the distance between, uh, between these two regions. And it's the same thing that you would do when you hear an echo in a tunnel, right? If you could measure the, the, if you could measure the time between the different echoes and you know the distance, you know how far away did that echo, uh, that, that echo happen, right? So it, it's the same thing. So we need then to measure the two signals. Right? So one coming directly from close to the black hole and the other one coming from the, from the, from the echo from these, from these clouds. And it turns out that we can actually do it quite, well, not quite easily, but it, we, we can actually now do it quite efficiently. So these are the same, these are light curves, so this is a variation of the light uh, against time. So this is about, this is, I think, two years of observations. And you can see that they are very well correlated. So you see this bump over here is, looks the same one down here. The one in pink are the, uh, is the signal coming from the clouds. And the one in the top is the signal coming from closer to the, to the black hole. So if you try to then just essentially play around with one and then just move it around from left to right and see where they match up, it turns out that if you move the, the, the pink one about almost eight days to the left, they line up perfectly. So that means that the distance between the black hole and these clouds is about eight days. So with these eight days, we multiply by the speed of light, and it gives us a physical distance without, without sending anybody to measure, but we can measure the distance, the, uh, the distance to, this, uh, to these little clouds. So that's great. So if we want to know the mass of the black hole, we have one of the ingredients. Uh, we have this radius. Uh, so, if we put these two things together and we divide by the gravitational constant, we get a mass of the black hole. Um, and we have now done this for about a hundred-ish black holes uh, in, the, in, the, in the universe, going all the way back to a quarter of the age of the universe. Uh, which I think is impressive, right? We don't need to go near them, uh, but the signals are there if you, if you can get it. And the math is absolutely, is, is incredibly easy, easy to get uh, as well. So, so that's fine. So then we can know, so now we know where these clouds are going around, and then we can know the mass of the black hole. So what, so what, so what can we tell about now the material that is flowing inwards? So we can play around with the same game. Uh, so, but just instead of having clouds, now you have this pancake-like uh, uh, structure. So you can have a same, the, the same, uh, sort of like the same signal, so these very energetic uh, light, uh, rays of light uh, that are, some of them, they will travel freely to our telescopes back here on Earth, but some of them will intersect the disk at different parts of the, of the accretion disk. And they will get bounced off and they will get echoed, right? So we can, if we can measure then the echoes from the different, from the different parts of the disk, we can start mapping the different distances to essentially to, like you can imagine it as little radii of, uh, of the disk and measure the, the whole structure of, of it. Um, and not only that, because this material is, this is very different from the, from the clouds. Uh, this is material that is flowing in. And as material flows in, the material gets hotter. It's getting hotter, it's spinning faster. So material that is, uh, that is getting closer and closer to the black hole, because it's hotter, is emitting, at, uh, it's, it's, it's emitting a lot more light and with higher energy. But as, and as you go out, material is further out from the black hole, it's spinning a lot lower, and, there, and its temperature is a lot lower, so it emits with lower energy. So that means that uh, photons that get echoed in the inner parts of the, of the black hole will come first because the distance are, is closer to the distance of the black hole, but they will also have higher energy. And the other way around, the ones that are further out, they will, be, uh, they will, they will have longer, a longer delay, but they will be emitted with, uh, at, at lower energy. So we would expect to have longer lags at, uh, at lower wavelengths. 
So if we take, uh, so now what we want is then, okay, so let's go and take light curves of at ultraviolet, at optical, and near infrared, and see if we can measure all of these different uh, delays, those different echoes. And this is exactly what I do with the Las Cumbres Observatory. So this is a global network of telescopes uh, that, are, that are span the whole, in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. Uh, in Chile, South Africa, Australia, Hawaii, the US, uh, close to the black hole, we need space observatories. And this is when we use the SWIFT X-ray observatory. So this is a small spacecraft that is now in its 20th anniversary. Like, yeah, 15, 16, it's getting, it's getting old, but it's, uh, it was initially made to do um, gamma ray bursts. So it's called SWIFT because it can very swiftly move around to, uh, to any part of the sky uh, to, to see any transient events. So what we do is then we use SWIFT to, to give us X-rays and ultraviolet light and at the same time that we're doing optical and almost infrared from, from the ground. So when we combine this and then we observe them in tandem uh, for every day, what you get is one of the best sampled uh, light curves uh, ever, ever done. Uh, so at the top you have all the ultraviolet uh, the ultraviolet light coming from this AGN called Feral 9. So this is a very massive galaxy in the southern hemisphere. Very bright, very, um, um, yeah, very bright and very variable. Uh, so we have, this is, all the, this is all the information that we have for one year. We have been doing this for five years now. Um, so now what we want to test is whether we can actually measure the disk, right? If we can actually do this. So I will try to focus on this little feature that you see here, right? So I'm going to put a little line at the top of that, at top of that, uh, that little curve. So if you remember, what we would expect is that the ultraviolet light will be echoing from closer to the black hole, so we would expect that to come first. And light that is coming from further out in the disk should be uh, should be uh, coming later at infrared wavelengths. So now I'm going to shift this to the peak down here. And hopefully you can see that the, that the line that is aligned to the peak down here is actually a little bit to the left of the peak down here. So this is exactly what we would expect from echoes coming from this accretion disk. So if now you go and measure all the little, how this how these, all these little echoes from all these different 11, uh, 11 uh, light curves, you have something like this, where you have here the ultraviolet, you have here the near-infrared, and all the other optical bands in here. And you can see that from ultraviolet to near-infrared, there's about seven days, seven light days. So that is how big that, that disk is, seven light days. To put in comparison, uh, and the other neat thing about this is that if we believe our accretion theory, right, we don't, if the, how this thing scales uh, as a function of this, uh, in this little diagram, uh, Pluto is about five light hours, Voyager 1 uh, with LCO, uh, to do it for over 50 sources in the local universe and try to make a big sample of, uh, and make a census of how big these disks are. And it turns out that, we, uh, that overall we are actually finding the, the signals of these echoes in essentially every single AGN that we look. Uh, but, and it's, there's always buts, uh, the, 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 what, we, what we expect from theory and our observations are discrepant. So it turns out that, for, that every time we go and measure these disks, they are a lot bigger than we expect, and we're not entirely sure why. Um, so at the moment we are, uh, yeah, so what you see here in black dots and in red squares, there are roughly the, the number of, I think with of AGN that we have published so far, we have a lot more that we are uh, that we're doing, and I can show you a live website where we actually have all the data that is coming in every single day. Um, 
But you will see that a lot of the AGNs that are out there are actually more massive. So we're going into the billion of times the mass of the sun. And we don't have, in the, no in the local universe, we don't have anything as big as that. So what are we gonna, so what, what is our, what is my, at least my plan? Is that in the next few years, well, in the next decade, a new telescope, uh, telescope is being built in Chile, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, that is, what, that is gonna do the most, the comprehensive survey, time domain survey uh, ever, ever done. So this is an eight meter telescope uh, that is being built in Cerro Pachon in Chile. I've been in the mountain right next to it, so I only saw it when it was mid-construction. Uh, but they're getting close, so the whole idea is to have it operational in 2024, 2025. Um, but for that, they have built the biggest digital camera ever assembled by humanity. It's absolutely massive. Um, and it, what it will do is will take picture, it will photograph the whole southern sky three uh, every, every two to three days. So we'll have information on how the sky changes uh, uh, for billions of, of stars uh, in, in the next few years. And because AGN are very prevalent, we're going to have tens of thousands of light curves of AGN where we can try and measure the sizes of all these, of all these disks. And hopefully, this is what we'll try to achieve with, um, with, our, um, uh, with, with our program. So our, uh, both our programs at LCO and with LSST, they really complement each other because they, we, can, we can measure things from just a few tiny, tiny puny 10,000 10, solar mass black hole uh, to a few millions. But LSST will definitely do that um, uh, for a lot more bigger. And more importantly, is that LSST will probe back in time, right? They, uh, because these, the, many of these AGNs were actually uh, at very, very high redshift. So they have been, they, they were formed very, very uh, back in the, in the history of the universe. So we can actually start measuring uh, with this technique how, ma how, massive, how supermassive black holes grow across cosmic time. Because we can measure not only their masses, but we can measure their, their accretion rates of how much matter is flowing into the black hole. So then we can see how they are actually growing uh, through the billions and billions of years uh, of, of our, the history of our universe. So, so with that, I'm just going to go uh, uh, with my conclusions and I'll open the, the floor for questions. Uh, but hopefully I can convince you that this reverberation mapping or echo mapping technique is, is absolutely fantastic. It actually, I think conceptually, is very easy. And it's incredibly powerful that allows you to measure black holes uh, and measure distances at very, very, uh, in galaxies that are very, very far away. Um, these experiments that I have been leading uh, using multi-missions, so using space observatories, plus the ground robotic network of telescopes, are, are giving us the best data that has ever been assembled on these, uh, on these objects. Um, uh, and the two key things that we are providing is the masses of the black holes and, the, and how fast the material is being fed, so what is known as the accretion rate. This example that I showed you, Feral 9, is probably one of our best sampled uh, objects. We have been observing it three times per day for five years. We're going, we just started on the sixth year of it. And we're trying to maintain it because we want to see how the, how the disk changes through uh, these. These things are massive, so they take very long time to change. So you need to keep uh, observing them to see any, any, any meaningful change. Um, and more importantly, the quality of the data is now starting to reveal discrepancies between our theories and uh, uh, with the new observations. So clearly, we don't know everything. And there's a, there's a lot of things there to be... Uh, to be um, uh, to be learned. Um, we will be doing more of, this, uh, more of this monitoring. At the moment, we have 50 of this, and I can show you the website if you're interested. Um, but I think I'm very looking forward to what, what LSST will be delivering in the, in the next decade. Um, so there's some links there where there's a lot more information about the projects and about what I'm doing. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions.
Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. That's really good. Um, we've got time for some Do questions like now. Record. That's okay. Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're in the hall, put your hand up. Um, if you're on Zoom, put something in the chat. And if you're on um, YouTube, then put something in the, in the comments there as well. So is there anything in the hall here? There we go. Um, I was wondering, as soon as they saw the title of the talk, why you call it echo when normally if we're dealing with light, we say a reflection, if something comes back at us? Yes. Um, so we're calling it echo because, I mean, we do have reflection of light. So it's a little bit of that. But, what we're, but the signal is being echoed. So it's not only the... It's not only reflection of light that is, that is happening, um, and it's technically not really reflection. Uh, actually, the light is being absorbed by the gas, but then being re-emitted. So the original light actually gets destroyed in there, heats up the gas, and then it gets re-emitted. But the, the overall signal is still perseveres, right? So with this original signal that came very close to the black hole, that signal really gets, it gets echo, right? So if you could form a, if you could speak in light and just say your name, the <laughs> disk will, will, will essentially say that name back to you, right? So okay. I think it's, it's have, we call it echo just because it's, a, I think conceptually it's a little bit easier to understand what is happening because the signal doesn't get jumbled once it impacts the disk. It actually conserves information from the original part. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Just to pick up on that, uh, I'm curious as to what percentage of the distance the light would travel below the speed of light in a vacuum, because you're talking about absorption of light, so effectively you've got radiation diffusion at that point, which is going to be significantly slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. And I'm guessing, but it's a question for you, that that's actually a small fraction of the total distance? So... We'll see how can I can answer this. Um, so when the light gets absorbed by the by the disk, um, the it's 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 very quick. Uh, so the, it gets thermalized. That that energy gets thermalized inside the atmosphere of this disk very 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 quickly. So we assume that there is very little delay from the coming in and then from coming out. So and the optical depth is small compared with the total distance. Yes. Exactly. Great. So that's the assumption. And, I think, and we think it holds overall. Any other questions here? Again, just curious. How, uh, how do you know for sure that the light that is received by the telescope is the one that you actually sent? Because if there is that uh, deflection or reflection, how do you know that it's not bouncing somewhere else? Right, so, so the question is, how do we know that this light is being bounced back to us yeah. and not from any other place? Mm -hmm. um, well, so in reality, it's not like you only have a single photon of light that gets reflected to you. So if you can imagine that this is like a lamppost that is shining down, it's shining down on all the, like all, in all, the, in all the light here. So we cannot pinpoint a process on how that geometry works. But that's, part of, but, but that's a good question. That's actually part of the big unknowns in, in, in how to interpret all of this data. Okay. Are there any more questions in the hall before we move to Zoom? Oh, one question here. Yeah. Um, does this procedure oh, depend sorry. at all on the orientation of the accretion disk? Uh, yes. Um, overall, all of these, uh, so if you recall uh, one of this here, right? Uh, so all of these, in order to see the disk, they have to be relatively uh, face on. Because if they're very edge on, this very puffy uh, dusty torus will actually block it, block your line of sight from everything that is happening in the, in the middle. So they have to be relatively face-on for you to see. Now, the effect of the, 
uh, you can actually measure a little bit of the effect of the inclination angle. And if, and, if, and if you apply accretion theory, you can actually retrieve that inclination angle from the light curves themselves. So that's something that you, that those light curves have actually information about that inclination angle as well. Uh, but you can only do that in the best quality data, set, data that we have. And even then, accretion theory, it's, it works, but there's still caveats in there. So we take all of those measurements with a pinch of salt. We have one here, and we'll go to Nigel. Thank you. In the previous slide, we had the collision. Alpha and C is proportional to M, M dot. Um, what, oh. which variables are defaulting in that constant term? Like the equation up there for Alpha and C is proportional to all those variables. So which constant term? Like, can you just elaborate yep. on the constant term? Yeah, so the question, the question is, uh, so what are the constants here that are uh, relevant that make this equation work? So this equation relates to this tau is the delay, uh, this m is the mass of the black hole, this m dot is the mass transfer, so how much material is flowing in, uh, and this lambda is the wavelength of the particular light that you, that you observe. So, here in between, there's, uh, this is proportional because there are a lot of uh, constants in there. And those constants relate in part to the geometry of this accretion disk. Uh, they relate to, and they are other constants like the Stefan Boltzmann constant and there's a Planck constant. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, fundamental constants in there. Uh, but they're just a number. Right? Well, I think what, what matters here is how these things scale. Um, so these four thirds, right? So what this is telling you is that the, does the, that the delays that you observe in any particular, between every two particular wavelengths, they should be scaling as the wavelength to the four thirds. So uh, if I go back to this, what that means, that, what does mean, what that means is that if you plot all your different delays between all your different filters, they should be very close to this line down here. So that's the way that it, they should be. In direction. Uh, and thirdly, um, a, do the, um, uh, I've forgotten the third one now, what was it? Uh, <laughs> I'll come back to it. Yes, so th those two things, is, is the relation, and oh yeah, is there always one black hole uh, at a, at a, in a galaxy or is, a, do, have you come across any galaxies who have more than one black hole? All right, so let me start with the first one. Do the, do the galaxies, uh, if massive black holes are also in massive galaxies? Yeah. I think that was essentially the question. So that is what this other sort of plot tells you. So I think I talk about this one, right? Of how fast the stars were spinning. This one tells you, this is the, the luminosity, so this is how bright the, the galaxy is. Uh, how bright the galaxy is just tells you how many stars do you have. And how many stars do you have tells you how, how, uh, how, how massive that galaxy is. And again, you see that there is a correlation, right? The most massive, the most massive black holes have the most uh, bright, uh, the brightest galaxies. And because they're bright, they must have a lot of stars, so therefore they should be more massive. So how can the galaxy know about the mass of the black hole? Right? That, that, that is a major unknown in galaxy evolution. Uh, and one of the things that we think of is this, ga is this AGN feedback, right? that, this, that the AGN can pump so much energy, so much gas into the galaxy itself, that it sort of uh, regulates how much stars you can make. Right? In, or, in order for you to make, to, make, to make a galaxy bigger, you need a lot of gas, right? You need gas to cool down and condense and form stars. But if you have an AGN that is actively pumping ma not only light but material out, prevents material from cooling down and collapsing. So this AGN can regulate and stop forming stars and you can stop making the galaxy bigger. So we think that these... This, this is how this very tiny little black hole can have an effect on the entire galaxy on itself. 
Now, second question. Can you remind me? <laughs> Yes. So uh, the question is whether the galaxy and the disk are rotating on the same plane. Uh, most likely not. Uh, they're probably misaligned. Uh, um, we, there's, there's very little information on what the true inclination of that black hole is. Uh, the best sort of, sometimes the best way to getting it is when you observe uh, jets coming from the, coming from the black hole. And then you can sort of absolutely get what the angle of the, the perpendicular angle to the disk is. Uh, but often that is misaligned with the, uh, with the galaxy. And the third one is whether there's only one supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies or whether there could be multiple. Uh, often when we see all of this, there's always evidence for a single supermassive black hole, but there's nothing that, uh, that that prohibits to be more than one, right? Some, uh, many of you remember that this, that the universe is very dynamic, right? The galaxies, galaxies are actually merging and colliding with each other, and if every galaxy has a black hole, then you will have two black holes that will be merging into a single galaxy. And this is what, so uh, a few months ago, there was this uh, very interesting result from uh, the pulsar timing array that they discovered this background uh, noise of gravitational waves from orbit from binary supermassive black holes. So I think there's it's still not fully. Uh, I think there's still some doubt on the data, but I think there's strong evidence that they, indeed there are a lot. There are billions of these binary black holes that are generating this. Uh, so there, there should be. So in fact, we're working on a. Uh, so there, uh, we're working on a paper with a colleague in the U.S. where they, uh, they she had the theory of, of uh, there was a, a particular AGN that some people said that it was a double binary. Uh, but we did we applied this different method because it turns out that we you would expect that if you have two two black holes, and they're very close together. And one of and there's enough material, you will create an accretion disk around one of them. It turns out that only the smaller one would be in, be able to hold that disk. The bigger the bigger of the, the two black holes will dissipate very quickly, but the smaller one, because it's, everything is a little bit more compact, should have a disk. So if you apply this same technique of the echo mapping, if you try to measure the the lags on how it on how it goes. Uh, if it, if it were two AGN, you would only observe a very tiny disk. And what we actually observe is that it's a massive disk. So most likely it's only one AGN instead of two little AGN. But there are, I think there's only, I think if you talk to people, they would only say that there's one really good candidate for a binary black hole out of maybe 10 candidates. And so, yeah, we're still looking for them, but they should be there. You okay for a few more questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very happy. People are obviously interested. Yeah. Um, Sarah, is it Sarah on Zoom? Yeah. Sorry, can, um, you, can you start again? Sorry, Sarah, we, we missed you there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, okay, yes. thanks, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the first question is from Peter. Does black matter influence the rate of rotation? Dark, dark matter. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, it so dark matter affects the rotation of the galaxy itself, but at this uh, at this very uh, at this very short distances, uh, it doesn't really it, it doesn't matter that much. No, uh, the ma the mass of the black hole is the dominant source of gravity. Uh, that is dominating the whole gravitational field. So, it, so dark matter is not a huge component. It's there and still be affecting a little bit, but it's really it, it it's really the supermassive black hole that dominates everything. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so another question we have from Norman Hansen: Could the dust condensing at the outer edge of the accretion disk 
be ejected out to contribute significantly to the production of molecular clouds, particularly in the early universe? Uh, Yes, yes, it can. Uh, so there is, there are theories of uh, so this dust must be able to they must levitate. So you have not only radiation, so the light coming from the black from the from the from the accretion disk and the black hole can push away this dust, and uh, and that that dust eventually will permeate and go out into the galaxy. And it is very plausible that some of that gets feedback into. Uh, regions where new stars are formed. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is definitely possible. Uh, and one would expect these dusty outflows coming out from, uh, the, um, uh, from very close to the black hole. Thank you. I don't know if anyone's got any more questions on Zoom. Will, is there anything on, on YouTube? Any questions? Um, <coughs> no additional questions on YouTube. Excellent, excellent questions. Okay. okay. Are there any more questions here before you finish? Well, can we thank Brad again? That was really good. Thank you. Really good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Clearly hit the spot with lots of, lots of interest there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm very happy. Okay, um, we'll move on to the, the sky in November. Um, I thought I'd start with Fran's beautiful um, image there from, from TD in Tenerife. A star and moonshine over TD. Um, looks like it could be Mars, actually, with the, the color of the landscape there, but that's really quite amazing. Thanks to Alan Pickup for his uh, sky diary for November. That's always the, the basis of our, of our sky talks. That was my sky in October. I don't know about you, but... Um, <laughs> There weren't very many clear nights in this. I'm, I'm really hoping that November could be better. You can see the, the telegraph pole to the bottom right, which is right next to my, right in the way of my meteor camera. The moon this month, um, we're at last quarter at the moment. Um, so the next um, few weeks, good time to do your deep sky imaging when the moon's out of the way. Um, but the clouds are not currently cooperating, but let's hope for um, better, better weather coming up and the full moon on the 27th. There was a, a partial penumbral lunar, lunar eclipse um, last week. Um, I don't think we saw any of it. I don't think anyone saw any of it here. In Scotland, it was really, really badly clouded out. But Horst, one of our members, is in Germany, and he's caught it really nice and produced that really nice, nice montage there. Um, the brighter ones at the bottom um, are overexposed to show um, the, the, the shadow much more clearly, so that's a really nice set. And there's a, a composite image he put together um, showing the partial eclipse there. The planets for this month, so I'm showing uh, most of the charts tonight for the middle of the month, and this is from indesky.org, Dominic Ford produces that, it's a really useful website. Saturn is uh, relatively low down in our sky still, doesn't get above 21 degrees, in the early evening it's, it's still in the south, but the atmosphere does, does make viewing very fuzzy, that's the best I've managed with my telescope this year of Saturn, and not what to be seen on it. Um, just making out the Cassini division and a few of the, the, the fainter bands on, on the body, there's not much to be seen. Hopefully next year will be better. If you have JWST, then you can get quite a bit more detail in the rings, um, but we don't have that. And even in Spain, I think we would struggle to see very much at the moment. Um, that's a very nice, nice recent image, just taken the 25th of June. Um, Uranus is also um, it is high in the sky at the moment, not far from Jupiter. That's, that was a quick shot of um, Uranus. Um, not really very much to be seen on that either. It's quite small, um, just, just about beyond naked eye visibility and 3.7 arc seconds. Um, but it's green, and that's pretty much um, all you can get of, of Uranus. Next planet is Venus. That's really bright in the mornings. Um, at the start of the month, it's rising uh, around 2.39, and at the end of the month, 3.53. Um, its size is shrinking from 22 to 17 arc seconds, and its, and its phase is increasing from 55 to 68. This is a nice um, image taken by David Brett Tate. 
This is a nice um, image taken by Davy Brett uh, recently. You can sit in a, an eight inch telescope and you, you're actually starting to see some of the, the shading on the clouds there. So I think mean, that's a really good, really good shot, much better than I've ever managed um, with Venus. Jupiter is the star, I think, uh, th this month. It's high in the sky in the evenings. You can't really mistake it. Bright at minus 2.9 and 47 seconds of arc. Uh, a few of us have been trying to image it recently. Uh, Mike Christie's got it nicely there with a couple of the moons. And David and I imaged it, obviously, around about the same time. We've got the great red spot there. And I think it's Io, isn't it? That was, that's just reappearing from behind um, Jupiter. A lot more to be seen on Jupiter. And we've got a few animations here. So we did, um, both David and I, no, I caught the, the transit of Io, and, um, the shadow transit. So you can see the shadow of Io going across there. It doesn't go back <laughs> <laughs> normally. And um, David's produced a really nice, smooth um, animation there of the, of the clouds going over it. David used quite a lot more images than I did. I think I used 14 images. You used about 80, something like that. Yeah. If you want to find out what's happening on Jupiter, I recommend a tool called WinDupost. It's free. Um, you c it shows you where the satellites are, when there are going to be transits, shadow transits, and so on. It tells you where the Great Red Spot is, the meridian of the central <laughs> longitudes, and you can use it to derotate your images because Jupiter rotates so fast, you can't really take... Uh, we use videos to image it. You can't really use long videos because you'll actually notice the rotation of Jupiter within that. So we're at the, at the peak on the, on the 18th. Um, this is one from last year that Tosh White caught on his meteor camera. Um, I can't find any particularly dazzling ones from last year on any of our cameras. I think this is the best one that we've got. Uh, this is the sort of data you can get from the UK meteor network data. So we can see on the right hand the image that um, it was caught by a couple of cameras in Edinburgh, one in Ayrshire, and the meteor itself was over the north of Arran. And you can see the orbit diagram on the left that could be calculated from that, that data. Oh, so out of man, sorry, yes, I'll, I'll take that back. <laughs> I got my scale wrong. <laughs> I'm English, sorry. It is associated with comet Temple Tuttle, and, and, but it can produce a meteor storm around about every 33 years. Alan says it's unlikely this year. Uh, but here are a couple of nice historic images, one from 1833 that the Seventh Day Adventists had in one of their books. And they probably thought the world was coming to an end or something. And one in 1868. Um, I like the curved uh, trails on those, presumably the vapor trails uh, left in the sky afterwards. So um, next one, do you, Alan? You just 11 years' time, so. Right, 33, 34. Let's hope. Uh, we have our meteor cameras. We've now got 14 meteor cameras um, in, the, in the society, not owned by the society, but owned by society members. And um, we do have quite a lot of coverage now. So we're covering all of Scotland, Ireland, quite a bit of England as well, out to, out to Norway, and some of our members in Germany and Slovakia are covering quite a bit, so we're t gradually taking over Europe with our meteor coverage. Um, and if you go to our website, you can see the, the daily feeds of um, all our cameras in Scotland and, and abroad, so you can usually, usually find a meteor camera that wasn't clouded out um, last night, and there's usually something to be seen there. It's great fun watching them. Uh, we did have um, Orionids in October, and we had quite a few higher, higher rates of sporadics than we would have expected as well. So we had quite a few nights where um, our stacks for the night were really quite, quite full of, of meteors that we weren't really expecting because it wasn't really a, a, a heavy shower dew. Um, but these are some of the um, Orionids that, that we had. Um, the one on the bottom right there uh, with Jupiter very close by as well. So uh, great fun watching them. Comet-wise, there's nothing really bright to show at the moment. Um, but if you're looking at what's around, then the COBS website will show you the brightest ones for your location. On the front page, just put your location in and it will tell you. Uh, nothing very major. A comet Lemon there, H2 Lemon at the bottom, is the brightest one at 8 and um, increasing. I haven't seen a huge amount of 
information about that or images of that, but maybe um, we'll see more of that as it um, becomes more interesting. We are continually monitoring um, 12P ponds brooks as much as we can uh, when the weather allows. We've been doing it quite a bit from, from Spain as well, and it has had quite a number of outbursts. And Dennis Buczynski has just joined us um, as an avid comet observer. He uh, reports that 12P is in outburst again, um, mag 12.9, and that's a from the VA comet section there. These are two recent images of 12P, and on the left from Dennis, and on the right, Ian Smith took that, and Douglas Heggie has uh, processed that. And you can see the the interesting notched and winged shape that it's had. So it's been quite an interesting comet to watch. I wonder how many more outbursts we, we can get in this apparition. That has been over the past year, uh, but I'm sure it will come back. And that picture on the right is in hydrogen alpha. And there's always something to be seen there. Uh, constellation, so um, this is looking south at the middle of the month, around about 9 o'clock at night. So our summer constellations are heading west and starting to, to um, sink to the horizon, Aquila and Lyra and Cygnus and so on, the, the summer triangle. Over in the west, we've got the um, winter constellation of the east, the winter constellations are rising. So we've got Orion just starting to, to get up there with um, Taurus and Gemini and so on. We've got our planets, um, Saturn. We've got our planets, um, Saturn. Um, heading um, west as well, but Jupiter's still getting higher in the sky at, at that time of night. And there, um, riding high, we've got the square of Pegasus. So we take the, the top left corner and take a trip up there, and the right turn halfway along. I'm going to get to um, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And that's a picture taken with our telescope in Spain that Ramsey McIver processed. Always a good, fun um, galaxy to image. If you take a left turn instead of a right, you'll get to another big spiral galaxy, M33 in Triangulum, and that one's by Pat Devine. Cetus, uh, which is low down, quite low down, and it's not particularly interesting con um, constellation. It's known either as the whale or the sea monster. It's a pretty ugly sea monster in, in that picture. If we zoom in a little bit, there are a, a few interesting objects in there, not things you might normally look at. Um, so we've got NGC 246, which is um, a planetary nebula, which we haven't got in our Flickr uh, groups at all. I haven't seen it. Um, it's relatively large for planetary at 3.8 arc minutes. Um, so I think it should be a, a challenge for our telescope in Spain, um, Skull Nebula. And M77, the only image I could find in the Flickr group was this one, which was actually by me, which was when it had um, a supernova in it in 2018. Uh, but it's a nice galaxy. I didn't know it was called a squid galaxy until I, I looked at it recently. I didn't know it had a name. Uh, but that's also another potential tar target for a telescope in Spain. And this is probably the most interesting um, bit in Cetus, or the most well-known bit anyway, is the star Omicron Ceti, or also known as, as Myra. Uh, at the moment, you won't actually be able to see it because it's too faint. But it is probably the, the most famous long period variable. It's a pulsating variable. Um, <coughs> and its pulsate, pulsations increase it in, in size from th about 332 solar radius to 402, which is quite an amazing amount of pulsation. It will galaxy probe. Um, it actually moves really quite fast, um, Myra, and it has a 13 light year long trail of hydrogen gas um, with the oldest <coughs> material being about 30,000 years old, so quite interesting. This is actually the data from the BAA photometry database, and you can see at the start, it, it is around about the 1890s, um, and all the black dots, these are actually visual observations, so a lot of people have done a lot of observing of Myra over the years. If I zoom in on the latest data, you can see the actual light curve of, of Myra, so the, each, each of these so the, the rise in brightness is around about 100 days, and it, it fades away in about, about 200 days as well. The gaps in the data will be from the, the times it's, it's not visible. Uh, so an, an interesting object um, to observe, and probably not too difficult to, to calculate the brightness yourself if you want to give that a go. Um, I dug into the AAVSO um, database as well, and they actually have it going back to the discovery. I'm sure it wasn't... Um, 
input directly by the guy who um, uh, made the discovery. But the first two points there are actually, um, I can't actually read what to say now. Show that it was actually uh, the first observation is on the 23rd of August 1596, and it was at magnitude 2.8. Um, and the second point is on February 22nd, 1609, it was 3.5. So it was the um, first recorded by an astronomer, David Fabricius, who I know nothing about. Um, and he was a German pastor. I think he was also supposedly one of the first few to observe sunspots on the, on the sun telescopically, although there are a couple of observers who might disagree with that. Um, but the data is it's interesting how far, far it goes out. I'm, I'm assuming the AVA so ended it from historical records rather than any other reason, but um, a large amount of data there on, on Myra. Um, it's always interesting to, to hear the story of how things are discovered. So he was thought he was observing Mercury. It turned out it was actually Jupiter, which is quite a big mistake, I think. Um, he needed a reference star, so he picked something unremarkable. It turned out to be later, so um, that was him. Notice the variable star. Back to the sky, this is looking north about 9 o'clock at night. So we've got all our usual constellations, um, the plough um, at, at its lowest in our sky, but there's some minor as well. Over on the right, I've picked out um, three constellations that are starting to ride high because there are lots of interesting open clusters in there. Now, I know I go on a lot about globular clusters and how, how amazing they are, and I bore you to death with them. Well, Open clusters are even better, so um, go look for open clusters as well, and there are a lot more of them. So they're all formed from the same sort of, uh, they're individual giant molecular clouds, so they're really useful in studying stellar evolution uh, because they're all similar age and chemical composition, and there are about 1,100 oh, 1, um, categorized in the, in the Milky Way as well. Let's dig into those. So this is, this is the constellation Auriga. Um, it's got three pretty well-known open clusters, um, 36, 37, and 38. And um, these are the sort of images that we've been taking over the, the past few years of them, um, but these, are these two by, by Pat Devine. Uh, but recently we've had um, a different view of them because we've got a telescope in Spain and we can actually see quite a lot more in those images now. If we, if we take a, a comparison with what we have been doing from Edinburgh and what we are doing from Spain, um, they lie in quite a, a rich region of the Milky Way, and we can pick out M38 and the smaller NGC 1907, also the, the Fly Nebula, and that's so called because there's a spider uh, nebula nearby as well. But there's an awful lot more uh, in that image than we've been getting from here in the past. Perseus, also high up. Um, no surprise, between Perseus and Cassiopeia is a, is a beautiful double cluster, which many of us have been observing for some time, and it's great in binoculars and small telescopes, um, a nice wide field um, cluster there. Also M34, another um, well-known cluster, and that one's from Nigel Goodman. Moving on to Cassiopeia, um, the first one is M52, and um, this one by Pat Devine. And the bonus with M52 is you get the bubble nebula as well, which you can see in the center of that image. If you zoom out a little bit further, you actually get another bonus nebula, which is the, the lobster claw nebula, which is really, really rather nice. And one other uh, open cluster down there, which I, I rather like, is M103. Uh, quite a compact cluster, but lots of nice colored stars in there. And um, a fainter cluster, but actually a, probably a richer cluster, not so well known. This one by Horst Meyer-Dirk says of the White Rose Cluster or Caroline's Rose, and that's so called because Caroline Herschel discovered that as well. Let's go out and look for open clusters. They're even more interesting than globular clusters. 